Uh, thanks everyone for joining this uh, panel. Uh, we're going to talk about how uh, web developers affected web standards over the years, uh, which I think is a really interesting conversation. Um, you know, we, we've been chatting about it. We've all seen uh, the folks who are involved have seen this sort of evolution over the years of uh, you know web developers getting more involved in standards and helping to um, you know make change that really helps the ecosystem and, and developers and the work that they're doing. Um, so this this kind of started a while ago. Uh, I know. Um, Back in like 2013, 2014, uh, you know, we really started to see folks get more involved in, in standards uh, and, and affecting how things were evolving. Uh, what, what were you seeing at that time, Jory? Um, so 20, 2012, 2013 is a special time for me because that's actually when I feel like um, I kind of took, I woke up like seeing the matrix and like, oh shit, this is how everything works. I had been working at a, a web development consultancy called Boku and we were a little boutique shop in Boston and we worked on jQuery and we worked on Backbone and we worked on Grunt and we worked on Johnny5 and we worked on all these open source projects and we had, we were in our 20s and we had no idea what we were doing, but we were having a good time doing it. And um, we were hosting these meetings of the TC39 and the W3C's TAG and some of the other working groups. And I was young and didn't know what was going on. And um, one day we were having a meeting and they were having a meeting and I was like, oh, what's Rick, what's going on in there? And he's like, oh, we're, we're having a TC39 meeting and we're gonna, you know, argue over something. <laughs> Uh, and I was like, wait, you know, so you're, you're in there deciding how we're all going to do something? And he's like, yeah. It's like, that's how this works? You all just get in a room and argue with each other? And then you, that's what I have to do? What the hell, you know? So at that point, um, I, I felt like I, I needed to really, like, get involved and, and start understanding and then start helping other people because there were some other things that were also going on for web developers at the at the time, um, responsive, uh, you know, uh, design was was really influencing um, the libraries and influencing how we were building software. Um, there were a lot of really interesting things happening, and I think that's when you showed up on the scene too. Yeah, I mean, I I had been maintaining um, very early in my open source career some the ES5 shim and ES6 shim, um, which are you know polyfills, so that you can pretend like the old browsers you have to support are the new ones that you wish you had to support. Um, and Rick Waldron, who was a jQuery maintainer and worked with you at Boku, reached out to me on Twitter and was like, hey, uh, he, he had noticed me like participating in the old TC39 mailing list because I was asking questions, trying to figure out how to like not screw up the polyfills. And uh, he was like, hey, do you want to come to this TC39 meeting? And you know, the next one that they had that was local to me, um, I. You know, I was like, hell yeah, of course I do. Like, let's see what this is about. It felt like I was, you know, getting a secret invitation. And um, I went into this room and there were like 10, 11 people. It was very small. Um, I was, there were only two or three of us were felt, it felt like only two or three of us were younger than 50, right? And that's, you know, and uh, I felt like I was the youngest. And in that first meeting, I was able to provide like a meaningful change to what became ES6. Uh, it was the way that object.assign was gonna work. They had some sort of language in the spec that like, as it was iterating through the properties, it would catch the first exception and swallow every other exception. And then when it was done, it would rethrow that first exception. And it was just bizarre. And I also was able, like I had been talking to uh, John David Dalton, the maintainer of underscore, who also wanted like underscores uh, or Lodash, excuse me, Lodash's extend to match object.assign. And so I was able to represent both his and my opinions in the room and convince the room and they changed it. So object.assign works differently because I happened to be there saying some stuff. And that's an incredible feeling. Like it, I was addicted at that moment. Um, I went home and I like, I was working at Twitter at the time and I like convinced, I went straight to the CTO and I was like, we got to join ECMA, we got to go to TC39, and I've just never looked back. <laughs> you're, you're like 
crack cocaine moment. No, Very much. That's not, I'm not yeah. appropriate. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but but I think what you just uh, there's a couple of things that you just said that I think are really important to call out. And one is you know immediately that you were able to come into that room as an open source developer and say, hey, spec engineers, the open source developers are doing it this way, and if you if you continue this pattern, like it's like it's not going to break anything, you know, it's going to kind of standardize what everybody is already doing. And um, I think that era of, of, uh, of TC39 in particular kind of does represent a little bit of um, a shift from some of the, the gray hairs who led us through the first um, s versions. I'm sorry, I sh maybe shouldn't. <laughs> no offense taken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, who, who led us through the first uh, versions of, of ES in the, the late, early 90s and into 90, 99, where we hit sort of a winter, if you will. Well, and, and I had sort of before getting plugged into TC39, I had that sort of perspective of like, what are all these ivory tower morons doing? They don't know what real developers are doing. Like, this is bad and this is bad. And like, first of all, they're, they were very welcoming. Um, they listened to my feedback right away. Um, I definitely felt intimidated, right? Like, I think I was the only, I'm, I don't have a degree and I think I was the only one in the room without like multiple degrees. And like, they right and they like they like listened to me and that was that was a great feeling and but the other thing is um i think that they that the the group wanted mm -hmm. that input from the community and they weren't really sure how to get it this was before twitter was mainstream this was before everyone had a smartphone in their pocket like it, it was before a lot of people were on github frankly. exactly yeah and and the that that pattern of standards are developed by you know people who work in research departments or work on some like obscure like product um, area and not necessarily involving their users involving customers involving like the the people who um, may be building on top of them um, was really common and and I think in this era of um, of ECMAScript you started to see um, more of the part participation come into play and folks um, on this is back like again in jQuery days where okay because there was such a stalemate in the spec for so long jQuery and other libraries like you know started to get um, really popular and started to push things forward because people weren't sure if frankly there would be another version of JavaScript right so um, at that point I think sometime in late 2008 or early 2009, I don't know exactly when, they started to resume conversations. Can we pick, can we abandon ship on ES4? Can we pick up, you know, tr and start trying to build some consensus around what has become more standard with within the community today? Um, and then the jQuery project started sending Yehuda and Rick, and um, I think that really helped to unlock momentum and allow um, allow folks to start to find consensus on things that we'd already more or less agreed to. Yeah, and I mean, the progress has definitely increased, like the, the progress of the progress has increased, right? Between ES3 was in 1999 and ES5.1 was in 2009, as they had, like, as you said, when they just started to get back together. So that's nine years. And then six years later was ES6, ES 2015. And now we're on a yearly cadence and it's, um, it feels really slow when you're watching a proposal that you're interested in uh, advance and take years to, to make changes and to get blocked by things that seem silly. But like, and it's even worse if you're trying to drive that proposal and you're watching that, that slow down. But like JavaScript moves pretty fast and like the speed at which we, I think we're able, we've become able to gather feedback and incorporate you know, various opinions and come up with good outcomes, I think has, has improved a lot. Uh, and it's been really nice to watch. And the, as I said, there were like a dozen people in the room when I first got there. I, I think if, if we could, you know, teleport everyone to the, to the meeting who participates, I think there'd be 60 to 80 people at this point in the meetings that we have six times a year. It's, there's a lot of people involved. 
Yeah, and I want to emphasize the point, too, that, you know, folks can get involved. You, you kind of mentioned, like, being invited in the early days, but uh, that's probably just because people didn't know, but uh, everything's online. Uh, I think tc39.es is the website, and, that's and right. all the repos are in GitHub, uh, so so I encourage folks to, to take a look and, and get involved if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> I think you know there was a similar shift happening uh, in a different organization around HTML, um, and kind of a similar uh, some, some similar things happening. You want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So, so I think another um, thing that was going on in that in that era was, of course, um, devices. Suddenly, we have you know the internet in our pocket, and what's that all about? Don't, uh, you know, Dylan knows all about that. Um, and so, you know, we were, we were, as the web developer community, we were trying to figure out how do we build for those devices? What are some of the challenges as we put more and more media on those things? And so, you know, we have pictures, we have things that we want to um, show people, and we have to do that in a, you know, um, sane way. So some of you may remember this particular um, battle, but over over the picture uh, element, right? Um, so you've got a group of very passionate um, and experienced UX developers um, who felt very strongly that the best way to um, handle something um, and, and handle responsive images in particular was to do that with the picture element and the source set attribute, right? And so um, that was actually a pretty big disagreement among some of the folks uh, leading the HTML spec at the time. Um, and thanks to their hard work and their sort of stick to itiveness and just really gathering all of the folks who are like, we are working on this. Well, this is our this is our problem. This is our need. This is our pain. And we need you to evolve the specification in a way that we can use it, right? This is how we want to, this is this is how we do things. Please do not standardize something that you know we're not gonna do. Yeah, and I think in that particular one, it uh, watching from the sidelines, it felt like folks. Some of the folks building the browsers um, who I think historically have not often been web developers themselves. Um, I'm, not, I'm assuming that it, like I've seen some of that shift a bit, but um, they were proposing something that seemed performant and easy to implement for them, but it wasn't necessarily the thing that the developers wanted. And the thing the developers wanted might have been really difficult to implement or slow. And so there was this sort of tension between what we, the web developers wanted, and what the browser folks would able would be able to actually build. And I, I believe the compromise that was ended up with was a good one in that everyone was a little unhappy, <laughs> but like we got something that kind of worked and took the feedback. And I actually, since then, I think web specs have taken a lot. Like I've seen browser implementers conscientiously try to pay more attention to what web developers want, and they still have that same pushback, right? There's still that same tension. Performance and implementability is important to them, and sometimes the things we all want and need, we just don't get to have it because the browsers can't build it, right? But um, the fact that they're willing to pay attention is nice, and the more we can incentivize them to pay us attention and, and um, try to, and the, more, the better we can present our needs so that they can try and come up with a way to solve them in a way that you know that works for us, like th that's that's the process working is when um, we're all able to figure out how to better express ourselves and listen to each other and you know come to compromises. I think that um, example I'm just remembering it, it was uh, Matt Marquis Wilto, so that's I want right. to um, credit uh, Wilto for his work on that. Uh, he that was a very painful time for Wilto, um, but I think that uh, what he maybe inadvertently did was start a, a more of a trend of um, the spec authors sort of listening to some core constituencies and going out and seeking their input a, as part of the process. And that responsive images community group has now evolved because it's not just images that needs to be responsive, it's lots of other things. So it's now the responsive issues community group. And again, it's a great space for those uh, those users to, um, to, to share feedback early on to the different representative spec uh, groups within the W3C 
on um, issues that really affect uh, and needs that they really have. And, and just it's like echoing what Joe was saying about anyone can just go to the TC39 repos and, you know, kindly add your your informed opinions, okay. please. But um, similarly for the W3, like they have all these community groups and you have to go sign up on a website and find the group and click a button, but then you're on the mailing list and you can talk just like everyone else, right? And the same thing, like be nice, respectful, follow codes of conduct and try and read some stuff before you say things. But like anyone can just hop in and, and you should if you feel like you have something to offer. And uh, you probably should even if you don't think you have something to offer because you, you probably do. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about like um, implementing things before their standards essentially and I know this happens sometimes in the browsers but also in like polyfills and such. I think you kind of mentioned that in the beginning there. Uh, can you talk about how that works and why it's important? Yeah, I mean, um, so there is, it has been for decades now uh, a wide ranging best practice in the web development community, do not modify objects you do not own. So this means like language built-ins or web platform built-ins, don't screw with them. However, polyfill authors, that's all we're doing. <laughs> like that is entirely what we're doing. So it has to be done very carefully. And the reason is because if you modify built-ins in a way that, um, or there's a lot of ways you can modify built-ins that will actually obstruct standardization in the future. Um, there's, you know, I, I could list off a bunch of examples, but there's a bunch of libraries from the late 2000s, early 2010s, MooTools, Prototype, Scriptaculous, and things like that, that um, at the time it was, it was less, I, I said decades, but it was actually not as long as I, I wish it was. Um, at the time it was actually considered kind of okay to just go mutate stuff. And so these libraries were doing that and, you know, they didn't, they thought like, it was defensible at the time. Um, history has shown otherwise, but they didn't know that. So I'm trying to be diplomatic here. But uh, some of the modifications these libraries have made have like actively blocked proposals, mm -hmm. you know, in the last five years or six years or something. And they've had to like rename things or like right now there's a stage three proposal for a grouping method to like take an array of stuff and group it into an object with names and subarrays, right? Uh, and it, we want it to be called group. And we probably can't because some code on some bit website that's big enough, um, you know, it, like has installed that somewhere. And the same thing happened for like string contains versus includes and all, you know, there's a, there's a whole long list of these. So it's, um, it's very, for language built-ins, like my advice that I always give is until it's stage three, do not ship it. And uh, for web platform built-ins, I would, you know, I, I'm not familiar enough with the progression to know exactly when the time is, but I would say when two browsers have shipped it, you're good. And if only one browser has shipped it, especially if it's Chrome, hold off a little bit because um, Chrome is uh, a little eager sometimes to ship things, and, but they're also willing to pull them back. So like shit, Chrome has it is not enough of an evidence that it's permanent. Um, but if two browsers have it, it's, it's like pretty good. And so browsers are implementing things before they're officially a part of the standard? Yeah, well, and um, as the actual proposal process that TC39 adopted after ES6, ES 2015, uh, includes stages where stage four is the final one. That's when it's like merged into the specification. But stage three is like, we think it's done and we don't think we can get any more feedback unless we actually try to build it. And the requirement to make it stage four is that it has to have been shipped. So like your, our process actually requires it to be shipped in some form, usually like unflagged and stable and you know, available by default in order to get it into the spec. So um, individual browsers and engines have their own level, amount of uh, enthusiasm or caution about how, you know, when they ship which proposals, but um, like it is an actual requirement that it should be shipped before it's in the spec. Because uh, the intention is because we want the specification to document reality and not to be this, you know, um, like, I'm forgetting the word I'm looking for, but like a, a aspirational document of like, this is what we hope it should work like, but if not, nobody's actually doing it, right? Like a standard, a specification is just a piece of paper unless everyone's following it. And, you know, so we, we're trying to make the JavaScript spec be the thing 
that everyone's following and not just the thing we hope they would follow. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction, um, you know, because you could you could standardize on something and then have it go terribly wrong for whatever reason that you didn't think about. So to have it out in the wild first uh, really makes a lot of sense. Um, I was going to just add that, like, I think, you know, that that shift that you're talking about coupled with other patterns that I think web developers really pushed for through, like, the test the web forward movement that happened early on. And that's where we got, like... Um, more um, support and like buy-in and use for like web platform tests and the test 262 suite and that kind of thing really helped to um, you know speed up the process it's almost a little bit like it enabled the continuous delivery if you will of of, of ECMAScript in a way that frankly wouldn't have been po wouldn't be possible if we were still sort of um, sticking to sort of the other other methodology and I think that's just like that's a very cool and very important shift that our industry saw and I think you know like I think we I think they kind of led on it uh, that I'd love to see um, transfer to other uh, other industries yeah and that's actually I, I sort of forget the evolution over time but like when ES6 came out, nobody had implemented any of it until after it came out. And also, not one browser fully complied with ES5 until years after ES6 came out. And like I know this painfully because all of my shims had to feature detect all of the many ways each random browser and browser version like deviated from the spec. But on top of that, um, the there's this compatibility table, um, uh, Kangax, like it's like you can Google ex6 compatibility table or something and um, it was just a bunch of like green and red check marks probably like mm -hmm. in Luke's talk earlier like the NPM status board was when it first started out and it just oh, eventually the the browsers realized and the engines in general realized users care about this they want things to be the same and so we either have to change the spec or we have to follow the spec and they went and did those things and those tables are mostly green at this point. There's just really random edge cases that are off, you know, in some cases. But, like, they've done a lot of work to try and, yeah. like, consolidate on a single set of rules. And that's really helpful. Like, the, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the amount of, of like, browser-specific CSS and JavaScript hacks I have buried in my poor, suffering brain from the last 20 years that, like, modern de web developers just don't have to deal with, like... It's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's glorious how much better things are yeah. than they used to be. And the, the Kangax tables, again, that he just was like responding to, okay, what effing works where, you know? And then now that's something that we, we take for granted that we can just go right. to MDN web docs and look at the BCD data and see what's working and, and, you know. Um, and it's all nice and tidy and knit together for us because developers did the docs in an open source way. Developers did the tests in an open source way. Developers are deploying the spec continuously in an open source way. Um, that's rad. Yeah. It's really cool. And I'm reminded too of, of uh, like coffee script, yeah. which seemed like a really creative way to kind of uh, muck with things. Um, and I think some of those things were brought into the language, some of them not, but uh, those were really interesting. I felt very creative, <laughs> I guess. Is the well, it was that, a very creative <laughs> experiment. <laughs> yeah, really that was. is how I learned more about ASI, so there you go. Tell me about ASI. No. <laughs> we're not gonna talk about semicolons today. <laughs> Um, I, I meant to mention this bef uh, earlier, but like the, the uh, both uh, ECMAScript and, and HTML kind of had a jump in their versioning. Like, what what was going on there, particularly with HTML? We went from what HTML was. What was well? What was there was there five? was HTML three and four, and um, and, then, and, and then back back in the year two thousand, I had you know there was these validation badges you could go get. You could like run your website through and it tell you how compliant you were. And I would be really excited and put little badges all over and like I'm compatible with all these things. <laughs> um, it, the HTML five, the idea was they wouldn't have to ever make right. another one. Uh, well, go ahead. yeah, and then and then there was also. Um, I think the other thing that kind of happened was we were kind of thinking about HTML and CSS kind of together. Um, CSS versioning is 
actually super confusing to me um, because they're, they're the, of the way they split the the surface right. of that specification up. And so um, I think for some of those efforts, there's such a you know disparate disparity between um, like just what the needs are in some of these APIs. So it's the versioning of like one to two to three just doesn't make as much sense to describe all of HTML as at a single version when, um, yeah. And and for ECMAScript, it's also a little funny. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of a living standard at this point, right? Like as soon as something merge, is merged into the spec, it's in the spec. That's the spec, right? Um, but the, like you were talking about HTML5, right? Um, in the same vein of like, web hacks that you don't have to do anymore. There used to be all these different doc type declarations at the yeah. top of your HTML file, and you could put things in standards mode or quirks mode, and different browsers did different things. And with HTML5, I guess they got lucky and figured out that if you did doc tape HTML, it gave you the least weird behavior in all the browsers. And so they're like, that's it. It's just that forever. And then they like added new stuff on top of it. And it, it really smoothed out a lot of the incompatibilities we all had to, to deal with at the time. Um, but, you know. it, but I think it did maybe set the groundwork for us to think about specs in a way that is more adaptive. And yes, we do need to have, at, at um, for, for varying reasons, moments in time where we lock something in and we say, this version is canonical, this is what we're shipping. And, and that may be less important to us as workaday developers, but it becomes more important to your companies that are shipping product on top of your work. Um, and so for those reasons, we, we do need to be um, developing uh, standards together and, and making periodic uh, notes of like, this is final, this is approved. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're done. It doesn't mean that maintenance ceases. And that, that's a big, big shift, I think. Yeah, I think there's another tension as well that like, like in a company, you're often told, you know, move fast and break things or like perfect is the enemy of the good and just, you know, what is it? Uh, disagree and commit, things like that. And in a company that makes sense, but in software, like in, in open source software in general and standards and stuff, uh, no is temporary, yes is permanent. And so it's actually really important that we gather as much information as possible before saying yes to stuff, before adding things and making changes and shipping things. And the more, the more everyone kind of understands the, I don't wanna get too philosophical, but like the intrinsic humanity of every other person <laughs> and like, the more we actually empathize with everyone else and, and the things that they care about and the things that, that they that they suffer through and like, you know, the, like the, the more that browser de like developers understand that what, like what pisses off web developers and what makes their life easier and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? Like the more web developers understand about like why some things can't be implemented in a performant way or like kind of how browsers sort of work under the hood so that like, that's why this pattern is faster than this pattern, right? The more that there's that shared in understanding and empathy, the more we're gonna be able to build stuff that is the right thing or is the least bad thing or that is like the most open to further extension and evolution and iteration. And, you know, so it's, um, I think the biggest, like the biggest uh, thing I'm optimistic for seeing the last, you know, decade or whatever of standard stuff is how much, like how, more, how much more open the processes have become to collaboration and participation. Even the, the venues that, you know, require membership dues and so on, which are most of them, right? There are still plenty of ways to collaborate and participate for free. And like, like I encourage everyone to do that because we want everyone's voice and, you know, and input. It feels like a good way to close the, our conversation. I'm not sure what time this ends. I have no idea. Okay. Um, I'm inclined to ask about temporal, but I don't know if we want to get into that. Uh, the the temporal uh, proposal. Yeah. Okay. Let's because uh, that's uh, you know. Time. Sure. So <laughs> um, I'll pre I'll give a little context. Um, anyone who's worked with JavaScript date knows that it's terrible. It sucks. Um, it's like 
broken in all sorts of ways. It's hard to use to deal with time zones. It gives you mutable objects. It's blah, 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 blah. Um, it's to the point where, for years, the only rational thing to do was use Moment.js. Mm -hmm. um, because, like, that's the only non-terrible way to work with dates in JavaScript. And uh, Moment has its own problems. It was d originally designed in a time when mutable AI, uh, APIs were considered OK. And we're now in a time where they are largely out of fashion. And um, you know, it's it's a very large library, but part of that is because it has to deal with time zones and locale information. And anything that claims to be smaller probably isn't accounting for all those data. But um, and there's a few competing libraries to Moment as well um, that are trying to provide a more functional interface or be a little smaller and so on. Um, so the Moment maintainers a number of years ago started come, came up with this. Uh, language proposal. How can we fix dates and times in JavaScript so that they're not terrible? And uh, that proposal is called Temporal. And uh, it was like the original two people that drove the proposal, um, Maggie and Matt, um, were both maintainers of Moment and are both like extreme experts in dates, times, time zones, and all things related. And um, they pulled in the right expertise from the right folks. Um, there's, you know, as, as much as I don't want to take cues from Java, there's a, apparently a great language in Java called Joda time that, um, seems to do these things well. And so a lot of input came from the Joda time maintainer and was, was incorporated in, um, this proposal has advanced over many years. It has been stage three for about two years. However, no one's shipping it because, t uh, our, our TC 39 meetings are every two months. Not one meeting has gone by since it hit stage three where it hasn't had what is called normative changes, like a change that a user of the API would observe. You could argue that that, you know, like breaking changes in most ways. So uh, basically until that sort of settles down, no one's going to ship it without a flag or anything. Um, and similarly, like I have a bunch of polyfills. I haven't tried to build one for temporal yet because I, I want to wait till my, you know, I'm not trying to hit a moving target. Um, but the very moment, and pun intended, that temporal stabilizes and polyfills become available that are backwards compatible, you know, and in ways that there are a few polyfills out there, but they're, you know, aiming for moving targets and they're not incredibly backwards compatible. They're more trying to hit completeness instead of uh, supporting all the browsers and engines you might care about. And, um, the, but the moment that that happens, everyone, every library, every application should just drop every date library and date itself and only use temporal and you will all be much happier for it. Um, it, you know, every, every TC 39 meeting, uh, the temporal champions pop up and they're like, here's the latest changes. We hope these are the last ones. So the, ne the next TC 39 meeting is next week. Hopefully those will be the last changes we see. And we will call that temporal day and we will declare it a federal holiday. There you go. <laughs> So there's been a lot of hard work done on that proposal over a lot of years, spanning a lot of champions, and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for when that day finally comes. Great. Uh, any questions from the audience? You, sir? You, sir. Is there... <laughs> kind stranger. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> has there been any other languages that ECMA has or is, you know, taking inspiration from in terms of language development? Um, all of them. I mean, like the the room is uh, is filled with people who love and hate all of the languages in aggregate, <laughs> and some of the people in the room have designed some of those languages. Um, and every proposal, part of the 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 process, it's expected that prior art in in user land, like in regular JavaScript code, but also in other languages, is explored. Um, the general sense is uh, if every other language is doing something a certain way, we should be careful before deviating it from it, but we still might if, it's, if we think it's better for the language. And if a bunch of languages haven't decided on, a, like haven't cohered on a single consistent way to do something, then we should look at the trade-offs of each of their approaches and try and figure out what choices make the most sense. Um, yeah. So yeah, basically uh, every language contributes something. Any other questions? There we go. Other than temporal, what's the next most exciting thing that is coming down the pipe? 
Um, so from TC39, um, I mean, there's such a long list of proposals that I'm interested in. So like, um, I'm champion of pattern matching, but that's only stage one. So like, don't get too excited yet. Um, but we're, we're doing, there's a, like six of us championing it and we're doing a lot of work trying to work with implementers to figure out a form that will be palatable and solve all the use cases. Um, things that are more advanced, right? There's um, array change by copy. So all the, a lot of the methods on arrays that mutate stuff like sort and splice and whatever. Now there's two sorted and two spliced and you know, there's a, there's a couple other methods in there. Um, so those, those will, there's a nice little helper convenience methods. Um, that's, yeah, there's a types, type annotations or types as comments proposal. That's still stage one. And that is, I think, it is unclear what that path forward looks like. Um, but, you know, the future is long. <laughs> so we shall see. Any other questions? No? Uh, assuming it's 2030 before we actually have a date library in JavaScript that's compatible with the rest of the world, um, at what point does it make sense to say, uh, hey, if by now you haven't figured this out, uh, maybe we should just use Wasm? I mean, I don't think Wasm was ever designed as a replacement for JavaScript. I've seen a number of statements to that effect. No, um, but it, it brings in all the tools that you oh, would like use. Use in, a Wasm date library. Right, in their own libraries, which still have sanity. And um, then will run faster in your browser. I think that that is certainly an option, right? You could do that now. Um, I think that the challenge, it's more than just about an individual library. It's that it's a... It, like having it in the language makes it a, a coordination point for everybody. So right now, um, it is expected if you're trying to pass around dates, it's either a date instance, and then a number of libraries will expect a moment instance, but only those two. And if you, or a string perhaps. And so if you are in start working with a bunch of, from any random library, like instances of something, whether it's WASM or JavaScript, um, you're gonna have to do a lot of conversions back and forth to cross all the API boundaries. And I suspect that you'll lose a lot of the convenience and performance benefits from doing that. Whereas if something lands in the language, which I think will be hopefully much sooner than 2030, but if something lands in the language, then that's something everyone will cohere on. Every API will just expect a temporal instance and it's really trivial to convert a date instance to a temporal instance. And I'm sure moment will ship a like dot two temporal something, right? Like, so it'll, it'll just be really easy to, just like it was with promises, right? There were a bunch of promise libraries, but they've all kind of cohered as like, this is the real promise, and that's what everyone expects now. You've also noticed that things like AI, blockchain, TensorFlow.js, they are basically moving all of the workload to a, a Watson kernel and just exposing APIs to it. And I, frankly, you could say that after a couple of years, Watson has more cross compatibility than JavaScript has tried to get to in 20. I think WASM has more potential cross compatibility. I don't yeah. think the actual implementations are quite there yet. And I, okay. like, there's a lot of, like I was overhearing earlier this week, like there's no way to composite two WASM files together. And so like, there's a lot sure. of uh, polish and tooling and, and uh, functionality that would need to add for it to be as viable a replacement as you're implying. But like, there's nothing wrong with doing that. If, um, if you can find a way to do something like I would say WASM versus JavaScript is, is more of a performance question or a question of what language you want to write it in. Mm -hmm. um, since some languages can compile to WASM much better than they can compile to JavaScript. But beyond that, I mean, the API is, the outer API is the outer API. And that is, um, that is all JavaScript from the perspective of a JavaScript consumer. So I would just say, run your full application benchmarks, not micro benchmarks, like weigh the maintainability of who's going to be maintaining the code and who you can hire for that and what the resources are and stuff and make the choice that's best for your application. Um, I believe we're at time, so I'm happy to take my answer off there if necessary. But um, how often and how much do performance um, needs happen with re in spec conversations? Like I believe MAP might have had some specific performance um, parts of the spec, like methods needed to be something. And so like 
uh, temporal, for example, are there, um, is that common for performance amplification to be discussed as part of the spec? So kind of answering this a little bit in the abstract, um, and then maybe we can just talk specifics because we don't have a ton of time. Anytime we're evaluating proposals for a language feature, there's tons of trade-offs that have to be considered. Performance and security probably top most among them. And so, you know, for people who care about making things fast, the most important thing is that it's fast. And for people who care about making things secure, the most important thing is that it's secure. And the the, the solution might not satisfy both cases. So. Um, there are lots of other things that we look for too, like how you know how how could this potentially be used incorrectly, and does that cause harm? Does that cause like unintended consequences? So um, it's it's not an easy question to answer, and it is why sometimes it takes so long for things to move through, because that um, that compromise on the right conditions of each um, you know thing is is part of what ends up driving the final outcome, and we can yeah. So the specific thing I'll talk to is there's another proposal that um, I failed to mention earlier, uh, set methods like intersection union difference. And I believe if intersection, there's a pathological performance case where if you have an empty set as one of the two sets, it like depending on how you write the algorithm, it could either be really, really fast or really, really slow. And the champion of the proposal it's, deems it unacceptable to have it be really, really slow. So he's trying to figure out a way to write the algorithm to to make it be like to like make it work. And um, that has delayed the proposal a bit, but like that's very important to him and, and to others as well. And so like that is that is coming up as a topic. So I know we're um, at, at well at time and we're standing between you and lunch. Before we take off, I think I just wanted to plug some of the projects at the OpenJS Foundation, because we're on the OpenJS World Track, that I think are really important and influential in this space. And also invite you all to come to an OpenJS Standards Working Group meeting sometime if you're interested in learning more about how some of our projects like WebDriver or Globalize or Node are influencing and um, um, and, and really leading change, I think, in key places, uh, this, the spec world, we would love to have you. So thank you. Yeah, you can find out more openjsf.org slash collaborate, uh, links to the calendars and such. We have a standards meeting every other week. Uh, so be happy to see some of you uh, at the next meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.